dig around here what Harrison's got to say. <laughs> <laughs> we we worked with Harrison enough. <laughs> We've heard this. Before. We've heard this. <laughs> Any opportunity to not be with him, you take that. Are you saying you're an old dog and it better be Some of that is the decline of the sales tax for a number of years that I'll show you that later. But we don't know how much of that was when they pulled the vehicles. <laughs> so you just have to add all the numbers together that were impacted and try to track them. There was a significant rise in sales tax last year. So that actually brought that number down. But, you know, over time you should have grown, not... Yeah. That doesn't count what you should have grown. <laughs> You're just trying to get back to debt mm -hmm. to zero. <laughs> the, problem, the problem with the law is the state keeps taking more well, the bigger, bigger percentage. Right, and that happened last year. And I, I don't know if they came back and adjusted again. Every year they do something. Every single year. But I mean, if you read the law, basically we're, we're kind of stuck in 2012 <coughs> numbers. Right. And to, right. That, mm -hmm. that amount, they, we're going to yeah. make sure you're good, but they didn't think about it. We're going to make sure you're right. good. We're going to make sure you were good at 2012. Not yeah. <laughs> I don't know where you were really at. In 2025, we're still getting 2012 numbers. Yeah. So, the, and we evidently are down to the last of the people who owned on their vehicles forever because it only shrunk about 73,000 in, in taxes. <laughs> so, the, and after 10 years, all the vehicles will be removed. We're only, I think, we're yeah. about four and a half years away from that. Um, so, but I've noticed that the decline is, is uh, really slowed down. Uh, but maybe that will pick up because the economy is really um, Yeah, that's what I figured. This, this economy right now, I think it's got a lot more people buying, so they're letting go of those vehicles that want the property down here. Myself and for you. From a county standpoint, I guess the budget standpoint, it might be hurting but it, it did feel a little better for me paying my tag bill this year. <laughs> oh, my, just being honest, you know, I know, but it hurt, but it really did feel a lot better. Yeah, the $20 is definitely better than what you Page two will show you that sales tax. Um, increase. Um, it actually went up over 4% in FY18, and you're running a, over 3% this year. Um, so it's had a, a good steady growth. The internet sales have not reported in yet, because that started January 1, so we won't know <coughs> until the end of, actually until February what kind of impact that may or have. Um, the crisp, the December numbers to me were a little uh, low because so I was of the understanding there was a very good um, December retail sales, or at least nationwide, um, but it only came in 8,000 above what it was last December. So that's not, that kind of made me want to wonder if something was about to fall down, but then the internet sales will kick in. So we'll see. Harrison, will you comment on the, <coughs> uh, the local option sales tax? That issue has been brought up recently as far as um, 
how that money is distributed, the impact on the municipalities, and that and how that is calculated and then used for reduction of tax. Well, the, the of course the agreement was made um, so many years back as to what percentages were going to be between the county and city. That agreement is sent to the Department of <coughs> They use that percentage for 10 years until it's renegotiated. Whatever comes in, realistically, is rolled back because when y'all calculate your millage, you have a gross millage, and then it shows the impact of the sales tax from the preceding 12 months. The, the main point being that that tax is rolled back by Lowndes County, countywide, and right. the municipality rolls back. <coughs> Every with, city rolls back too. So therefore, the, the claim of a disproportionate <coughs> amount of tax is addressed by a double okay. yeah, rollback. As, as a city resident, I get two rollbacks. I get tax rights, but I also get two rollbacks. Um, so. You know, it's always been my theory that it should have been based on a combination of the digest and a couple other factors. And if you do that, that gives every taxpayer back exactly what they should get back for the local option sales tax in terms of millage, whether they live in the city or a county and got incorporated. But I, I don't think we're going to ever get there with the state legislature. Is that does that make sense for y'all? I mean, I know that's been brought up um, to y'all, and I just wanted to, for y'all to have the opportunity to hear from Harrison in a somewhat independent position as far as that the usage of that local option sales tax for the reduction of taxes. Right. Um, and, in, and, excuse me, and in Lowndes County, Stephanie, we're different than a lot of counties because we are paying that back. We have a year's worth of reserve for local option sales tax <coughs> for rollback. You want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, we, that's part of our $16 million is there's a year of that local option sales tax held in that. Um, so if you ever lose it, you've got a year's worth of it to try to get that or some other source of revenue back to replace that. Right. And I'm seeing where more cities are doing that too, as a designation of property tax rollback in their mm -hmm. retained earnings. Um, so our net assets, as they call it now. Um, the problem, the confusing part is that it shows up as a line item in revenue, and therefore most elected officials think that is a revenue. Well, if you didn't have it, the tax revenue would just be higher. Right. It's just a, a substitute. Mm -hmm. right. So when you look at it, it really isn't. <laughs> it's just you've taken that money, and instead of taking it from the taxpayers, you're using it to help fund and give them a reduction in their millage rate. Um, a lot of city governments will argue with that and say, oh, no, it is a revenue, and we use it for things. But in practicality, when they are turning in their millage, it shows a rollback. Mm -hmm. And when you get their tax bill, it shows a rollback. <laughs> it can't be both a rollback and a revenue. Additional revenue. <laughs> yeah. Additional revenue. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. But uh, along <coughs> those lines, Harrison, and, and I've heard other communities talk about this, but Lyles County gives us that rollback as a true rollback. Where some communities, as you were kind of insinuating, if I heard you correctly, they're actually using that as a revenue source. Well, they call it that, but they don't really. They need to go look at their millage um, documentation. I got you there, but I'm just saying they don't, they don't understand what they're saying. Polite. Documents the mayor or any mayor signs off on shows the gross millage and the rollback calculation. So they, they, it is hard to say you're rolling back this amount of money and at the same time you're spending it on other things. That's right. And that's right. The I, I was just saying, was it just after we came into office that we did that 
the last loss negotiation? No. When, when, when are we set for the next loss? We haven't done, since I was in office, we haven't done a loss negotiation. Now, we did floss, but we didn't do it. Lost, is that a 10 year deal? Yeah, two years after the census. Yeah, two years after the census. And whenever you do it, it's too soon, I promise you. We were hoping that they would come up with some better formula or legislation. Now, they may wait till the final hour before that 10 year period comes up because everybody gets at the same time. It's not like the. SDS where they got rotated out. Every county and city are going to be negotiating at the same point in time. So my guess is there'll be a lot of pressure from both cities and county, GMI and SCCG, to come up with a form rather than flies across the board. That applies across the board. Now, we, we talked about the loss briefly uh, because we were talking about splash at that time uh, when we first got in there. You know, that's what it was. You're correct. Uh, mm -hmm. um, oh, and I, <clears throat> I did want to point out that the SPLOS 6 is finally, I mean, yeah, 6, the Parks and Rec facility is being built and is spending down. It should end this year. I'm excited about it. <laughs> we finally got that money spent. And of course, they have additional funds in the current spots, which they'll rotate over to as soon as those funds are spent down. I think they're down to about six hundred thousand through January. Um, I was asked to pull up some T spots numbers; they're very preliminary. Unfortunately, on this, the state is not providing breakouts, of city and county portions. It's only providing the number in that first column, which is just the countywide T spots. And of course, the local governments don't even get all of that. The local governments only get 25% of that. And then the only way to determine what the local government got is <coughs> we'd have to literally go to the county books and see what they gave you. So, <laughs> but 25% though is the 25% that we get for um, non discretionary. Funds. Right, but I can't tell you how much is this is for the city of Alaska, how much is for the county, and how much is for. I can only tell you what they finally sent you. Gotcha. And that's the first time we know what you have for local local discretionary. And so far, you've built up two hundred ninety-two thousand. But there's no where's on squash or lost. I can go on the DOR website and see the allocation even before it hits the bank account and give you a breakout. This we're just going to have to see it when we get it. <laughs> when are we protected to be able to get it? Why not? When are we protected to be able to see it? Or get it? Well, you get it every month and they usually, they usually do it at the very end of the month, usually around the 25th to the 30th, somewhere in there. They do a wire transfer in. Um, and, you know, they'll send some to the cities and they'll send some to the county. But as far as how that number was determined with the breakout, you, you really don't have any information. You just know, <coughs> if you go on their site, it says t spots and it gives you a number. And that's that what change? where it will be separated? I, I don't think so. I think one reason they're having trouble separating this is it's by projects. You have, you have different projects for cities and counties, and then you have, that's within the I'll, I'll check. I'll check on that, yeah. but I want to say that the basis for the original calculation is based on population. Right. And so they may be using population <coughs> numbers to determine what that percent allocation. Is. I'll check these numbers. I hadn't, you know, divided to see if this is a fixed percent. Yeah, I can check with the TIA director as well to right. find out exactly how they and are. If that's the case, we can at least do a prediction of what it should right. be. Uh, I'm um, sure I can get that. Yeah. Like I say, it's coming in as, as one tax to the county, but there's going to come a point <coughs> that is going to have to be uh, distributed. Well, so, or does the city, is the city getting 
He said the state's, the state's already distributed, so we're getting yeah. we get his account. <coughs> oh, I got you. Okay. Yeah, because okay. the, the local share for the October was 384,600, but right. the county only got 92. I got you. Okay. So I have to assume that the cities was the rest of that. We hope they got it. We hope they got it. I mean, we've had some numbers. Well, it's like the difference in our well, I know. Yeah. It's like the difference in our SPOS <laughs> distributions on the same dollar. The school board will get mm -hmm. a different number than what yeah. we do. There's That's no way to it. tell. I'll, I'll check with them though and, and verify yeah. how that calculation is. Oh God. Well, that would be helpful because we were. Everybody was scrambling to get an understanding of what in the world we were supposed to do with this. <coughs> we did determine that the county has no money coming in that it has to turn around and turn over to a city. Like I do with SWAT. Okay. Okay. okay, that's what I was trying to clarify. Is that because of how that yeah. So they're doing the distribution. They're doing the distribution. Um, and I'm, all, I'm positive that because I have at least one city that asked about setting up their T-SWAT account. They were receiving money directly. <clears throat> um, page four talks about the upcoming SPLOS selection. Um, this is the absolute minimum timeline that y'all have to meet. Um, <clears throat> ideally, you really are going to have to bring it back in the spring. I don't know if you all want to be negotiating SPLOS over the summer because your out date is August 23rd. And that's the last day to be notified in the city of the city. <coughs> well, with people, you know, you got a bunch of cities and you got people going in and out of town. Um, to start that late would be difficult. And you have to have everything, <coughs> everything wrapped up by October 4th. So ideally, you should start conversations in May. I would think, possibly June, but when you start getting into July, you're going to have a difficult time getting people together. Well, I think we need to start really as soon as possible. Well, I, I do February too. is a very busy month for us. Right. Uh, so hopefully um, we can send out the notice and I'll start those discussions. Right. Everybody's getting their projects in now. They're working on those. So <clears> if the cities have their projects ready, the county will have our projects ready, then we'll be able to come together and start again. And that allows all the legal requirements and election requirements. To, it just gives them more time to get all that done. Right. So, so you don't run into any problems. Um, page five, I tried to calculate a growth and a number for this next splash. It proved difficult because most of this past splash you've been going down. <laughs> And I don't feel like that's going to continue, but I don't feel like the growth factor of 4.27% last year is going to continue either. I know it didn't because it's only 3% halfway through this year. So I chose 2%. That comes to about $136 million. The last floss was $150. The, project, the projection on the current is $125.5, and we only got 12 months left. So... Um, I feel like the 136 is probably right. If the internet sales start to bump it in the next few months, we of course could adjust before y'all start nailing numbers down. <coughs> I went ahead and got the 2017, which is the most recent census numbers, and you can see there the projection based on census of what the county unincorporated areas and then the cities would get based on that. Actually, it's the county wide, but it's based on the unincorporated population. And then it shows you your SPLOS percentage and your projected amount. And then I, I, sh I show you uh, basically what is projected out of SPLOS 7 and then the variance. Now, for the county, it means about a $10,000, $2 million increase. Um, so, presuming you stay with the population percents. And of course, that is in accordance with state law. If you don't reach an agreement, you can have a five year splash and you're going to go with the population percentage. Um, if you do not have an agreement. If you do not have an agreement. 
it should, the only penalty is it goes from six years to five, mm -hmm. but it will be based on the population percent. Yes. Because that's they use estimated, or they use? They will use, it is standard to use the most recent census, and this will be the most. We really can't wait for the 2018 census. That's way too late in the process. But they don't, okay, but they won't go off the 2010 census. I mean, no, right, they'll go off well, the estimate for 17. It's up to the local governments, but typically in all these negotiations, we've used the most recent uh, census numbers. And, you know, if someone wants to argue it, but actually some of the smaller cities, you'll have a, a fight among the smaller cities because some go up and some go down. But, but <laughs> there'll be a squabble. But keep in mind, those, those numbers other than the 2010 census are just estimated <coughs> numbers. Right. As far as what? Yeah, they, they, yeah, they do. Uh, the U.S. Census Bureau does an estimate every year and then extrapolates uh, what they estimate the population to be. And for July 2017, the total countywide population was estimated at 115.489. Of course, only naturally the unincorporated area is growing faster than most of the cities. Some of the cities continue to have growth. So basically what you're saying here is that the projected, based on your projected income for SPLOSH 7, we're, we're going to come up roughly $25 million under what SPLOSH 7 actually was projected at on the referendum. Right. Which means then that there's also going to be a shortage for projects that were figured in in SPLOSH but, 7. Correct. But we've been tracking that all along. That's right. Yeah, so, and I assume the cities do too, but we track it, and actually I just sent out, because we're down to 12 months, and people like Mike Fletcher, I said, okay, between now and the end of this flush, you got just a little bit under $3 million to spend. Mm -hmm. Don't spend any more, because <laughs> that's all you got left. <laughs> and then we looked at all the capital projects um, and where they stood. And so ultimately, they'll all be completed um, some of those had a fixed amount because we knew that they had to have that amount regardless, and then some of them were variable depending on how the swaps. So if the numbers went down, the road funds, the law enforcement vehicles, about seven or eight of those items went down as far as what could be spent. Any questions so far? No, just, just thinking, you know, I guess the, the, the more the, the city of Annex invest, add into the population base, the Adds to the population of the city. Of the right. city. Decreases. Yeah, population and decreases population. our population in the county. Correct. Correct. Right. Um, page six is our uh, standard analysis of health benefits and retirement. Health Fund took another one of those big jumps from 6.2 million in expenses to 7.8. Um, so it was not a real good year for it, but that's unfortunately um, the way these things go. It's just a matter of, you know, the incidents and claims you have in a given year. Um, it'll, it'll track up and down in any given year. Um, so um, that's where it landed. <laughs> Not much more to say. You did cover it in the general fund. We did have to appropriate more funds, but the general fund had plenty of money to cover it. So, Harrison, you want to comment about uh, our discussion uh, email about OPEB? Yeah, I've actually put that on here. I'll, I'll get to that. It's okay. on the last page. Nice. I put in one other, page seven. This is a chart that's actually in the CAFRA. We do several statistical charts at the end of the CAFRA. It doesn't have that variance line or column on it, but I, I was looking at it. I was looking at all of them to see should I share these and you know point out things from these statistics. But what caught my eye, and this one really happened, 
typically I look at the unemployment rate, and the county tends to track well with the state. Um, but when I got to looking at the difference between the per capita income, unfortunately, Lowndes County has a, a rising uh, variance between its county per capita income and the state average. And I don't, I don't think that's a big surprise because you've got a kind of a boom going on in the north end of the state is creating rising wages as a state average. But then we, we don't have as much going on on the south in this state. But that discrepancy is starting to show up in the per capita income. So I just thought I'd point that out to you. Um, so we have more people working, making less. Yeah, there, less yeah we're, we are, you know, just everybody says we're at full employment. Well, unfortunately, yeah, but they're working at lower pay jobs than, they're, than the people who are finding jobs in the metro area and north end of the state. They're we're still making more, but we're just not growing as fast as yeah, that variance is getting bigger. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, the per capita <coughs> went up almost three thousand dollars per household, but the, you know the, the state average went up significantly in the last three years. Um, so it, it's really dragging behind, which is not good for the overall economy of the county. Now you mentioned. Uh, basically more rural Georgia. Um, is this information, is this something that you created or is this general information that would be available in other, from other counties? Yeah, yeah we can pull these, you know, by county. You kind of get some comparisons. Just to kind of see where right. Lowndes County is with their peers. Right. That'd be a good, some good information. Yeah, we can that pull that. Uh, DCA. No, this is actually, I think I'm pulling this also off of the Census Bureau. They pull yeah. a ton of statistics. <clears throat> and um, so the Census Bureau is, uh, if you have Census Bureau website, is usually where I go to. And you can key in any county, any city, um, and get these numbers. Yeah. I can um, send you the link. Yeah. 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 It's a little cumbersome. I'd like to just see what that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, from so. our peers to kind of see what we study. One thing that we identified recently in doing some research on another project was that right now about half of our community's population is either under 18 or over 65. So that means we're going to continue to age into that over 65 population. That Those percentages are going to shift if we don't start working hard on some things to keep young people here. Mm -hmm. That's going to continue to increase that burden on people in the middle as they look to retirement and, and things like that. So we've got a challenge there. Yeah. Well, if either end of that spectrum increases, then it's really going to narrow your, let's just say, your middle income earners. You're going to have retirees are going to be more on a fixed income, lower income basis, and you're, certainly your younger people are going to be starting in their careers at lower income, so as those numbers come in, that middle income that would affect the, the, the biggest picture, that, that you know, we've got to be careful that that doesn't shrink too much as a community. <clears throat> well, I think that there's some things, and we'll talk about later today or tomorrow, about, you know, considering that retired population and what are we doing to keep these people active and engaged in our community so that their health isn't suffering and they're not just going home and they're not becoming a burden on the health care system in other areas. So we need to, you know, part of our community-wide planning process look at, at what those things might be. But I, <coughs> so you also have a lot of retirees that go back to work and they're, they're willing to work at Walmart as degrees, you know, um, <laughs> and those yeah. other jobs. Uh, so it's kind of... Yeah, that's in my retirement plan. Yeah. That's in your retirement plan. I like people, so I I have one other question, and Joe, I, I, I know we uh, went past it, but uh, anything that we could do or anything that you think that is driving the health fund expense, I know it's this year. I mean, each year it's been more and more, but is there, is there anything that we could do or yeah, anything that's really driving it? Anything what's driving it is those $5 claims. Yeah, there's... As far as how we go in and, and tweak that, uh, and I think all of us who've been involved in uh, looking at that over the years, there's not a real viable option to reduce that. It hadn't been for any cities or counties. It's just trying, like we have, develop a wellness program to have <coughs> healthier 
their employees. Um, you know, try to encourage them for uh, uh, concerning their blood pressure, making sure they take their medication, so forth. And you know, when we first started doing this, we thought uh, tobacco usage was going to be our biggest deal. It's not, has not been. For us, it has been hypertension. I mean, the, uh, the, the health of our employees concerning their blood pressure is disproportionate. So the real thing that we can do to answer your question is to continue to try to educate those employees. Now, I, I think and I think we can statistically demonstrate this for you that when we, uh, before we began the program and where we are now with the program, we have a healthier employee. Is it drastic? No. But it is, I think, as I said, definable if we look at that. Now, the other part of it is that makes it difficult is the medical expenses. Just like everywhere else, I mean, we've looked and had conversation with where our hospital charges are compared to other hospitals. Some were higher, some were lower. Overall, you look at our hospital charges versus just like what Harrison was saying about the metro area, there's a greater competition in those areas where you don't have that as much here. When you look, okay, Archibald, Tifton, um, Coquit, maybe, uh, Tallahassee. But when you're in the metro area, you've got eight or nine hospitals within a 10, 15 mile radius in some cases. And uh, that does have some impact on those costs. But it's really trying to, to uh, hit a moving target from our standpoint. The best thing I think we can do is try to minimize the negative impact. <clears throat> yeah. If y'all disagree. No, what what we have this year in, in that increase that Harrison said sometimes you just have a bad year. We have about 10 cases right now that when we met with our broker just before the renewal that the, the claims for this past year were in excess of $300,000, and some of them more than that. We've got a couple of significant cancer cases, we've had some significant surgeries, and you just don't have those things occur every year, so really that big jump is, is there. Um, what Mr. Pritchard was referring to is really manage in the middle. So if you take your top 10% of claims off the top, that those are those catastrophic things like cancers and accidents and those things that you just can't do anything about. And then you look at your bottom 10%, which are routine compliance things, things that we've tried to use telemedicine for. That's working really well to my dip off during programs oh, yeah. like that. So you're keeping people at work and out of those office visits. Then you're looking at that middle, and that middle for us is hypertension. And so we're trying to focus programs and education. In fact, we have a meeting coming up um, week after next, again, with the broker. We ask him to run some utilization um, by type of claim. Um, for us so that we can tailor our wellness program over the next year once again a little closer to what send the people to the doctor um, and how can we help them be better consumers of, of that benefit dollar. One of, one of our options for employees has to do with telemedicine where they are able to make a call, get in touch with a physician, wherever that physician might be. Explain what the problem <coughs> is. And Mr. Marshall it, has it. Oh yeah, I use yeah. that one a lot. Yeah. Cool. So if kids got sniffles rather than having to take off and go to the doctor, they can prescribe you something and you can begin that medication. That's for those things that, as I said, are, are lower on the end of the spectrum. But it, it is very time consuming to our employees to have to take off. Yeah. The other thing that's hard to um, manage a little bit is the RX side of things. So there's an actual category um, now basically in the market for what we refer to as miracle drugs. So it's things like some hepatitis drugs and things like that that are new drugs that, that weren't on the market 10 years ago. 
Um, but one round of that hepatitis, and usually people don't have to do anything but, but go through the, the first phase of the treatment, is $25,000. So we have an additional contract um, with someone who's monitoring those RX costs for us to try to make sure that we're not using name brand when a generic would do and, and that there's not a, um, a tier step that we need to use. So if you went to the doctor and he said, you know, you've got X, um, and we need to go ahead and pitch on this medicine that's extremely expensive, we have someone who's helping manage that to say, okay, doc, do we need to go directly to this thing that's most expensive, or can we try this first to see if, if this works, and a lot of times it does. So I don't think there's a piece of, of the plan that we've not, you know, tried to put some additional thought into managing that. And cost. this is a... Uh pharmacist who is able to speak the language to both the physician as well as to the supplier of the, 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 the uh, pharmacist. So that has paid for itself and more pay. Well, I want to come back to what you, your initial statement was, and of course it's, it's shown that we're in the hypertension, stroke, heart disease belt of the country. Uh, we're pretty well dead center of it. Um, health department certainly recognizes that, and if you, if, if y'all recall, we actually provide some funding for the health department to operate a hypertension clinic that just addresses that. And so that's another option that the citizens will be able to use, because again, hypertension leads to a tremendous amount of other health care issues. That is a big part of what we. Um, of what affects, as you said, our employees. Well, we used to think it was tobacco use was the evil thing. It really now is, is more the buffet. It's more hypertension as it is anything else. Ooh. I'm sorry. It's the buffet. Yeah, it, it, the buffet, yeah. Well, they have buffets above us and below us, but you say we're in a belt. <laughs> we are, but <laughs> that's where it's all at. It's the belt. We <laughs> have, to put, have to put another hole in it and extend it out. That's right. We got another punch. <laughs> now, I, uh, I used to tell a medicine like that, you said, and, and it works great and everything. I was just wondering, I know we have, it's like 7.8 million now, and I, and I know every year health costs tend to go up. I just, I also just, you know, I've experienced the, the city of Idosta Care Hip Clinic, and I, I keep hearing that there's beyond savings in it. And I just don't, I, I haven't, you know, went into the members to find out <clears throat> just where they, they say it's the beyond savings in it. We've had and, those numbers and, and so forth, and I, I just think it might be interesting to kind of kind of see if, if it's something to look at. I know they say it's stabilized a lot of their health issues, the health cost issues. And we looked at this 10 years ago? And like three years ago. Um, and when, when we ran the numbers, <coughs> it did not indicate uh, the savings. Now, I'm not saying that the city's not saving. They may be. But we also sat down and talked to um, SGMC at that time when James McGahey was there. And they offered uh, us the option of working through the hospital for the same type of provision of physician, nursing, et cetera. Um, and because I didn't think we could keep those kind of employees consistently and pay them what that market would require. So the best thing for us was to be able to have those physicians that are available on call. You pay a flat amount <clears throat> for this service, as you know, but we don't have the expense tied into those physicians in a facility. If we, <coughs> if we move forward with healthcare, though, it, it, it might be worthwhile for the county, for the county to look at possibly contracting with a healthcare clinic of some sort, so that employees might be able to go if they choose to that clinic for things such as minor issues, you know, rather than certainly if you end up at a specialist or something like that, or rather than going to the emergency room or to the hospital for services, there may be a lot of things that there may be a possibility of contracting with some clinic for that type of purpose, which would be kind of back that's, toward that's that cool. model mm -hmm. there. Well, 
Okay. Actually, there are a lot of walking clinics available. Right. Why people want to go sit in the ER for four hours is beyond me. Yeah. Especially with a sick child when they don't need to. And we don't see, we track that because our plan um, decreases. If you go to the emergency room for a non-emergency um, type of issue, like some you just got a bad cold or you got a fever and it's 3 o'clock in the morning or whatever, um, there's a reduction in what the plan pays on that. So the employee has to pay half of that claim. So we monitor that. It's one of the things that, again, we hear with our um, broker reports. We don't have an abuse of the ER. It's more of just that if you've got a particular physician that, you know, your parents saw that physician and now you see that physician and that's who you want to see your kids, then trying to get appointment-wise into that schedule. But Harrison's right, over the past three years, we've had Apple Care come in. There's been some of the local general practitioner groups that have extended their hours. So I think we've got that availability. What we might be able to do, though, is work with one particular one to negotiate some rates. Yeah. You just Might can't make them go there. Speaking of hypertension, does anybody in this group take a statin? Yeah. I do. Mm. Anybody? What is, what is the statin? Lipitor, Zocor. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I've, I've exercised and dieted, and I'm at the point now that I'm going to make it. Well, that's going to reduce my Jake total is. cholesterol. Steak, egg, and cheese. <laughs> Are you seeing a rise in diabetes? That's the other big area. Mm -hmm. That's, and because of the cost of those drugs, which they shouldn't be that costly, but unfortunately they are. It's um, the supplies. And we have a discount for employees if they, um, and we tell them if it's a situation where you've got to have test strips or you need um, needles for your insulin or whatever, like, don't not take your stuff and don't not monitor your sugar because you can't afford that stuff. HR's got some help that they can provide if people come in for those types of things. Let me, let me just ask you real quick. Is everybody comfortable other than the folks down there working on their tan? <laughs> <laughs> is everybody comfortable? Okay. Okay. Um, the last page, A, I needed to sort of go through and explain OPEB, uh, which is Other Post-Employment Benefits. The county, just so you, I think you all understand this, but I just want to make sure we go through the details. They provide post-employment health insurance to retirees. Now, the employee has to have provided 10 years of service, and they have to be a minimum retirement age of 55 unless there's a disability. But if someone retires at 55, clearly they're not Medicare eligible until 65, so they're most likely going to sign up for this insurance. The non-Medicare retirees pay a monthly premium of 205 for themselves and 315 for family members. And the Medicare eligible ones pay 115 and 175 for families. This past year, a new accounting standard was implemented from the Government Accounting Standards Board that basically said any of these type benefits for retirees needs to be measured just like a retirement plan. Well, when they ran it, it under that, the new actuaries ran it under that new standard. Bounds County has a $51.8 <coughs> million dollar liability for these benefits over the long haul. And so, based on the statement of net position, which I know we normally don't use, but that is sort of the business type approach to the entire county, you've got basically a deficit in your unrestricted net position because of that. So what, what governments are doing who are trying to manage this is they're doing like the retirement plan is they come up with a trust fund when they start funding it each year just like, they, like you do your retirement plan. Your retirement plan, they're constantly telling you each year you need to put in this much money to stay ahead of the actuarial amounts. You would do the same with these benefits. Um, what I wanted to do at least next year is separate out the contributions and the cost 
because right now they're buried in the health plan. We don't, I mean, we could go dig it out, but I'd like to routinely see, okay, for the benefits that are being paid in, here's all the claims you're paying out, and then how much is the county going to have to cover just from that factor year in and year out. But eventually, you're going to need to look at a trust fund that will probably require more funding on a routine basis. Uh, I sent some information to the county on this, and the argument for it just basically says that when you're issuing bonds or getting a bond rating, this kind of uh, liabilities could impact your bond rating. Whereas if you go to this trust fund, it smooths out the liability. It shows that you have a plan, and it's not going to impact the bond rating as much. Plus, long term, especially if you've got a bubble of people coming up for retirement, this could really start to kick in and start getting very expensive. So somehow you have to start getting ahead of it and start funding it in some way, shape, or form. How many people do we have on retirement? Mm, it's less than 100, I think. Um, and we, we track those, that, that utilization as well to make sure, because you would normally think these, these are the oldest people that you have on your plan. This is a tremendous expense, and they're not. Um, they are, are by far lower than probably three other categories that include um, spouses of, of employees that are working and things like that. So um, they're doing a good job taking care of themselves, and we're not seeing the, the catastrophic claims even. We have zero retirees on our, um, our catastrophic claims report. Um, Quick question. If I'm not mistaken, if you say it's 10 years of service, I mean, just being vested, you still you get to qualify for health benefits when you do retire, say, at 55 or 60. Because I know other governments, you got to do do at least 20 years to get the health benefit side of it. Uh, and some of them 25 years to qualify for the uh, health benefit side of it. I mean, you, you're vested at 10 in, in, in all of them. But for as a receiver, the, the health uh, benefit side of it, you, you got to give them a minimum of 20 to 25 years. I think that's... I guess that's a beyond good, great benefit, I guess, for the, for the county, but it's a big liability, it looks like, too. Uh, well, and that's the other reason to at least start measuring it year in and year out is to the cost. But the other option is the county over time can make adjustments to this. Some counties cut off the employees when they reach Medicare age. Mm -hmm. They can go get a supplement. I'm not. My wife just did this, so I'm not quite clear on why the why this supplement they're paying to the county is seen as a better benefit. But maybe there's more to it there than I realize. I just don't know because you can get supplements for less than that. But I don't know who they're educated for that. Um, also, like you said, it could be for a longer period of time. So there, it's just like a retirement plan. You can make changes from time to time that may may or reduce the cost. And that will be going in, because we turn all that into the actuaries, that may reduce the actuarial amount. But typically you want to do that to employees that are coming into the system and not employees who have been there. You don't want to change yeah. the, the game plan midstream. Um, so that, that may not even have an effect in the short term. It would be a more of a long term effect. A long term policy type of thing. Because yeah. I, I, I know several people right now, they will retire, but they don't get the health benefits addition until they hit 25 years. <laughs> and that's just kind of how they generally do it versus 10 years. Because 10 years, someone can do 10 years and then go to another job. They bounce around. You, 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 and all I'm saying is a person that saves their 25 or 20 years, they're, they're really invested in the organization. The numbers, where do they, where do they come from? These, the bully charge, the 205, the 215, the premiums? They're based on our actual premiums and the difference that you see after the, when the, the reason it drops after you see Medicare eligible is because once you become Medicare eligible, they, Medicare becomes primary and then we shift to secondary. I was just curious. Well, that's about what? Yeah, they're based off the actual premiums. And most Medicare eligible people do get a secondary insurance. I mean, that's just standard practice. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Any other questions?
Any other questions? Any questions for Harrison? Harrison, thank you. We appreciate it. You're Can we, y'all want to take a short break before we get into uh, the finances?